Right. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you all. I can see Malcolm now as well. Malcolm, hello. Nice to see you. Always, always a pleasure to see you on the screen. And uh, maybe we might even meet in person one day. We're already living, I think, in the post-COVID era. So it has become possible once again to, uh, at my OU share, there are over 20 people in person attending it, apart from the, uh, apart from the Zoom people. <clears throat> And also my morning Kalo, I've got over 20 people in person. So I think people are coming back a little bit. There is a bit of a, a move back to what used to be called uh, normal life is, uh, has uh, uh, returned to us. Um, I think there's congratulations, Ellie, to your shul having a, appointed a new, uh, a new rabbi. Is that right? Democratic. What do you say? Demo democracy has spoken. The people have spoken. Democracy has spoken. Okay, so someone's got to speak. So I yes. suppose uh, democracy has spoken. Um, I know this guy from London. I don't know him yes. well. I've met him yeah. a few times. Yeah. Yeah. I've only heard good things about him. And I'm sure it will be a one. When, when is he actually uh, starting? Um, possibly, be probably before the Yom in Narai. Maybe he'll be here in August or early September. Very nice. I look forward to seeing him here in Israel. Yes. A very, very nice. Lovely. Anyhow, good morning to everyone. I see Dina has joined us. Good morning, Dina. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And uh, the day will come, Ellie, will it not, that we will have a sheer face-to-face -face at some point? Chadesh Yomeinu Kekedem, right? Yes. This year started off face-to-face, -face, yes. which means that you've actually got to put, you actually got to get yourself out of your house and uh, walk a few yards and um, relocate Relocate to the share. I see some people are shaking their heads. People have actually got out of the habit, I think, of moving. It's uh, <coughs> anyhow, I like that. Anyhow, um, it's wonderful to see everybody here. And I was thinking maybe today, Lichvod <clears throat> Yom uh, to reconnect a little bit to Yerushalayim. And um, as I've said to you a number of occasions, uh, we are learning safe operations. And my goal really is to show how all the important aspects of Jewish life and Jewish history have their shoresh, have their original uh, significance in Sefer Bereshis. That Sefer Bereshis is the DNA of the whole Tanakh, of the whole of Yahadut, and of our whole identity as Am Yisrael is in Sefer Bereshis. It then unfolds for the rest of the Tanakh, as DNA does, it unfolds into... Uh, uh, practical applications, generation after generation, but the Yisodos, the original uh, principles and ideas, are already in uh, uh, safe operations. Um, let me just start off with an interesting question, which is raised by some of the Mepharshim on the Gemara. You know, we have a tefillah that we say on Slichus, um, one of the tefillahs which comes from the Gemara, and it's a whole list um, of people in the Tanakh who davened and their tefillahs were answered. Misha ona liyona bimei hadoga hu ya'aneinu, misha ona l'shimshon v'plishtim hu ya'aneinu. In other words, all the people who davened and were answered positively were asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just as he heard the tefillahs of, of, of Moshe and, and Gideon and uh, Yona, so he should answer our tefillahs as well. But one of them, in fact, the first one is Misha Onal Avram Ovinu Bahar Hamoiria Hu Yaneinu. The same Rebbeinu Shleilam who, who listened and heard the prayers of Avram Ovinu on Har Maria, meaning the Akeda, he should answer us. There's only one small problem with that: that in the text of the Chumash, we don't find that Avram Ovinu davened for anything at all. We don't find that Avram Ovinu asked for anything. There were no tefillas. Um, according to the Psukim, there are no tefillahs of Avraham Avinu and Hara Maria. So what could that possibly be? He who answered the tefillahs of Avraham Avinu, um, he should answer us. So some of the Mephorashim want to say, Baral wants to say in one place, that maybe it's a reference to the, uh, a very, actually a very beautiful idea, that there are sometimes unspoken tefillahs. There are sometimes tefillahs which we don't articulate. There are tefillahs which are in our hearts, and we can't even find the right words for them, right? And Avraham Avinu clearly, in his heart, davened to Akarish Baruch Hu, 
that he would not have to uh, um, sacrifice Yitzchak, even though in, in the Olam HaMaisa, in terms of his activities, he went ahead with full Yira Shamayim, showing that he was willing to do it. But clearly in his heart, obviously as a human being, he prayed and he hoped not to have to do it. And maybe that's what this, maybe that's what this Gemara and Tanis means, Misha Onol Avraham Avinu Bahara Maria Huyane. But the Marsha, other before Hashem, have got a different pair, which, was, we're gonna, which we're gonna look at. That actually it's in Rashi, that the tefillah of Avraham Avinu is in Rashi. I think it's very curious that we say this tefillah regularly every slichus, and we never really think about the fact that Avraham Avinu didn't daven for anything at all from Mahara Maria. So yet you need to go into the Masiris of Chazal. That Chazal had in Teresh Balper a certain Masaira that there were tefillah, there was a tefillah that was said by Avraham Avinu at the Akeda, and that that tefillah was answered and fulfilled. So what was it? So let's have a look at a few psukim uh, from the end of uh, Pasha's Vayera. Uh, let's have a look here. So this, this text, yes, is the text up? Is it up? Yes. Good. Yeah. I've already become quite proficient at Zoom, I must be honest with you. I, I recently graduated from Kita Gimel to Kita Dalet um, in, in, in Zoom Zoom technology, because I discovered how to, I mean, the, these shiurim are recorded by Ellie and put up on, on YouTube, but other, other shiurim, like my kolo, I, 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 I uh, record myself, and I have never really found how to make a link and, of the recording and send it out, but I recently discovered how to do that, so I'm now in Kita Dalit. You'll be pleased to know I'm making progress. I got a good report uh, this year about my, uh, my IT uh, capabilities. But incidentally, I'd like to mention uh, to the members of this Shia uh, that on Mondays and Thursday morning in, in, in Talbia, in the Chobar Beit Zion Shul, I give a English a shiurim from 9.30 till 12.30, Mondays and Thursdays from 9.30 till 12.30. I have a morning kailo where I have over 30 people participating. It's been going for several months already. We first learn Rambam, then we take a break for coffee, then a bit of a chavrusa, and then we learn Gemara, and then we learn uh, um, some halacha. And it's, it's a full morning from 9.30 to 12.30, and everybody is welcome to come and join. Okay, uh, that was just a little bit of an ad advertisement. Uh, you know, self-promotion is a very important uh, part of modern life. And so uh, I thought maybe there are one or two people here in this Shia who would enjoy who would enjoy the Monday and Thursday learning program. I hope Ellie, you won't find it disloyal of me to to use a a Beit Knesset Hanasi Shia to promote a kolo elsewhere. Absolutely not, Rabbi uh, Kimche. I will promote you in Beit Knesset Hanasi as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much because. Kovet is not a million miles away from where your shul is. And the truth is, the fact that the kolel is in that shul is a bit random, actually. It just happened to be that they were happy to have it in their shul. I could have, I could have done exactly the same thing in any other shul as well. It just turned out that that shul was um, open. Okay, let's put that aside. So you can look at the text here. Yom Yerushalayim 2022. Let's have some ideas about Yerushalayim connect them to voracious, and then take them a little bit further. So what happens at the dramatic moment in, in uh, the Akedah, where Yoma, the, the Malak says to Avraham Avinu, there's been a change of plan. Don't touch uh, your son. Don't do anything against him. Here's an interesting word, the word Yerei Elokim. Avram Avinu here is defined in the Pasuk as someone who has reached the ultimate level of Yirat Hashem. Yirat Hashem, of course, is a spectrum with many, many different levels on it, but the highest moment, the peak moment in the history of Kali Yisrael and Yirat Shamayim was Avram Avinu's willingness to go through Akedas Yitzchak unquestionably. And that, and that middah of being unquestioning, that middah is the middah of Klal Yisrael, 
which actually is relevant also to this to, to our Yom Tov coming up of, of Shavuos. Uh, that Shavuos was a moment where Charlie Shaw said, Nasa the Nishma, unquestioningly, and as we're willing to accept the mitzvahs and, the, and, and, and all the obligations of the Torah without first questioning to see whether we like them or we accept them or they're rational or they make sense. We accept the Torah unquestioningly and that middle of, of total acceptance is called Yirat Shamai. That's going to be relevant in a minute to my general message from this. That Avram Avinu is called the Yirei Elokim. Ata Yodati, you have demonstrated that you are a Yirei Elokim. Right, this word here, Yirei Elokim. And, and uh, let's go right what happened. At that point, Avram Avinu wasn't satisfied. This is not the next important point. The first important point is the word Yirei Elokim. The second important point is that Avram Avinu is not satisfied that he's now filled with all these emotions and all this Yirat Shamay and all this intention to follow the Devar Hashem and to achieve a great uh, Tzivoy Hashem, even though it was illogical and immoral and unacceptable and it didn't make sense on any level whatsoever. But that feeling of his of Yirat Shamay he was willing to go through with and now he's got nothing. So what does he do? He finds Vayisa Avram as Einav. He lifts up his eyes. Famously, he sees a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. He takes the ayil. And he brought that up as a, so he made a carbon of that ayil. Tachas Beno, instead of his son. So this carbon now becomes the carbon which is tachas benoi, and there's a lot of uh, midrashic material about this Eloi shel Yitzchak, this ram which was brought at this moment at this carbon, because this moment of this carbon was of exceptional importance, as we'll see in a minute. What was what Avram was doing here wasn't just sacrificing a ram. Because you know, Noach had sacrificed animals, and uh, other people have brought carbonus before. This carbon was a transformational moment in Klal Yisrael, and really laid the foundations for Yerushalayim, as we'll see in a minute. But this was this moment we'll see in Russia. Anyhow, let's just look at the last pasuk here. The last pasuk of the story is that Avram gives the place a new name. Until then, it was called Hara Maria. Right? So you can see the word Yirat Shamayim has been adapted here a little bit. That Hashem Yireh, right? Hashem So here you have a little very interesting play on words in the story of the Akeda. That the word Yira is first the label given to Abraham. And then Avram takes that word and makes out of it a label for the physical location, the Shem Hamakom, right? That so this is a place which is Hamakom, and he calls it Hashem Yireh, which means God will see it. God will see and God will focus on it, and God will pay attention to this spot. And then he goes on to say, not only will HaKadosh Baruch Hu see this place, but also it is something else. It's Hashem Yei Hashem will be seen. Will be seen. And that's something else completely. In other words, to go to this place and see HaKadosh Baruch Hu in some sense. Of course, it doesn't mean visually. Of course, we can't ever see HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But to have a, a, a strong sense of the presence of the Shechina, the presence of the Kedusha, that will be in this HaMakom in this place. So here we have a very interesting description um, of this place. And uh, what happens is that the Chazal say that this place, Har Hamaria, is actually a Hamakom. Now the word Hamakom is significant. Can you see shape? The, the place is Hamakom, right? Before the Akedah, it says about Avraham Avinu, Vayaret Hamakom Merachok. He saw the place from a distance. So the word hamakom appear, appears several times. 
So I just want to mention this. I think we have mentioned this before in the Shia, but it's here it's particularly relevant, that throughout the whole Chumash, the Chamishe Chumshe Torah, the word Yerushalayim does not appear anywhere. We've mentioned this before, right? Which is actually a very interesting fact, right? Even though in the Chumash, it's very clear that there was a plan already, that there will be a place where they will build a base of Mikdash. But where will it be? That was left undefined, right? But for example, when it speaks about Aliyah Larego, there's a mitzvah in the Torah of Aliyah Larego, where are you going to go? Shalosh Pomin Bashono, three times a year, Yeroi calls a churcha, every man will come with Pnei Hashem, right? Where, where will he go to? The makom, ha makom, which what? It'll be, cho- it'll be chosen later on. Later on, you'll, you'll find where it is. There will become one day, it'll be revealed where this place will be. But until, until such time, the Torah always only, I think in Parshas Re'eh, it, in the bar, it mentions the word hamakom uh, four or five times, and it shaved him as well. So, for example, it shaved him. It speaks about the existence of a Sanhedrin, of an ultimate court of appeal of, of halacha. So it says If you ever come across a shaila which nobody can answer, what should you do? The kant of olisa el hamakom You've got to go to the place, right? Read the place, the Harabayas. What, what in the Harabayas? Because that's where the Sanhedrin sat. In other words, the Harabayas was not only the place which was the center of Karbonus and Kernim and Levim, it was also the center, the ultimate center of Torah. The ultimate center where the greatest Tamidic Hachomim of the era sat as the Sanhedrin in the Lishka Sargosis, in on the Har Habayis. And there it, well, well, it uses the word Ha Makom, the place, which place? Stay tuned, you'll find out at some later point, right? At some later point, you'll find out which, which place it is. And interestingly, throughout the whole of the Chumash and the book of Yeshua and the book of Shoftim, nobody yet knew where this place was. Nobody yet knew where this place was. And the Mishkan went from Gilgal to Shiloh. There was a, there was a Mishkan, which was the spiritual center of Karbonus and of the Kernim and the Vim, but it wasn't in Yerushalayim because they didn't know where Yerushalayim was. In other words, for the first like uh, 480 years uh, of Jewish, uh, uh, after Yitzhak, the, the Possek says that Shlomo Melech built the base of Mikdash 480 years after Yitzhak's Mitzrayim. But for all that time, for well, most of that time anyway, they didn't know where it was going to be. What's interesting is that, so, so does anybody know who was the first person really to know about the location of Yerushalayim? Who was the first person? I can't hear you, Dina. I know you're saying something, Dina, but you're, you are, uh, I expected you to say something. Shmuel Hanavi. Thank you very much. Shmuel Hanavi. So Shmuel Hanavi, right? In Sefer Shmuel, in chapter 19, so there it speaks about Shmuel Hanavi having a private, uh, uh, intense uh, uh, session with the young, newly anointed David HaMelech. And David HaMelech has this session with Shmuel, and Chazal tell us, based on the analysis of the words there, in Shmuel out of chapter 19, that Shmuel HaNavi was telling David on Piha Nevoa where Yerushalayim was, where the place of the Mizbeach was. He gave him a blueprint. And the blueprint for the Beis HaMikdash and the Harabayas was given to David by Shmuel HaNavi. And, Sh- and David initially thought that he was going to build it, but for various reasons he couldn't, bit of a mystery exactly why he wasn't allowed to do it, but he wasn't allowed to do it, but his son Shlomo Melech, he built uh, the base of Mikdash. Does anybody know why David couldn't build the base of Mikdash? Anybody, anybody know why he couldn't do it? Because he had blood on his hands from the wars. Oh, who's that? Michael Gross. Yes, yes. thank you. Yes, there's a pasuk in Divrei Hayyamim which says 
because you have blood on your hands from the wars. I must be honest with you that it's a, it's a, it, it's a difficult, that's a difficult possum because what David didn't have blood on his hands. The wars that he were fighting was the wars against the enemies of Israel who were trying to kill the Jewish people. He was fighting only Milchomas Hashem. He hadn't committed any murders, right? Somebody who's a soldier in the army doesn't have blood on his hands. He's done his uh, national duty, right? David Amelech's battles were all battles which were signed off by the Sanhedrin, by the Nevi'im. He knew exactly what he was doing. So why should it be that that would somehow uh, delegitimize him for being the builder of the base of Mikdash? Okay, there's, there's a whole Torah about that. I won't go into that for the moment. Because, because Rabbi Kimchi, he, he had blood on his hands through the manslaughter of Uriah. Uriah. Okay, so yeah, that's Uriah. your parish. That's your parish. No, um, uh, it's there. Okay, okay. That, 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 could be, that could be an interpretation. Uh, that's not what Chazal say. Because in, in terms of David HaMelech and Uriah Achiti, the husband of Bacheva, Chazal have got a whole different interpretation of that event. And uh, even though he shouldn't have done it, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a murder on his part. Uh, Uriah HaChiti was a myriad b'malchus, the Gemara Chaba says, that he had rebelled against the king and he was Chayv Misa. Anyhow, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, again, that's not my topic for today. I seem to be touching on lots of things this morning that aren't my topic. So I'm trying to navigate my way through various temptations to get sidetracked onto lots of other very juicy topics. But the topic is Yerushalayim and the Harabayas. That, that at the time of the Chumash, the concept of the Harabayas already existed. It was labeled Ha Makom Asheyivcha but the location of it wasn't known until Shmuel Hanavi told David Amel. David Amalekh made the blueprints. He then went and actually purchased, he purchased the land of the Harabais, and he gave the blueprints to his son Shloma for him to do, and the rest is history. But what's interesting is, what, what, what is it about, um, about this particular location which is so important? Why was this point, why was this place called and what Chazal say is that the answer lies in Sefer Bereshit, with Avraham Avin. At the, that's the Har HaMoriah, right? The Har HaMoriah is the Har HaBayis, that, that uh, Avram and Yitzchak on the Har HaBayis at the Akedas Yitzchak, they did something, right, which consecrated that spot for all future generations. So here you have another classic example of one of the fundamental strengths of Klal Yisrael, the location of Yerushalayim and the building of the base of Mikdash, and the foundation of it is Avram Avinu saying that the Vayikra is Hamokim, he calls it Hamokim, and he renames it as Hashem Yireh, Bahar Hashem Yireh. There's a Gemara, there's a Masechta in Shas called Chagiga. And Chagiga talks about the mitzvah of Aliyah Lerega. When you go up onto the Harabayas, please God, we should all have the zechus one day to go up onto the Harabayas properly, bring Karbonus to meet him Kassidrom, Musafim Kilchosom, like we said this morning <coughs> in Musaf. Um, we should be able to have opportunity to do that. Uh, but the, the uh, ability uh, to have that place as the Mokkim Mikdash that came originally from Avram and Yitzchak. How so? So it's interesting, in Chagiga, in Maseches Chagiga, right, the Pasuk says that Shalosh Pa'omen Bashana Yei Ro'e Kol Zechurcha as Pnei Hashem Laka. The word Yei Ro'e appears. The mitzvah of Aliyah Laregel is to come to the Har Habayis, right, Yeira'e calls the It doesn't say Yira, it says Yeira'e means you should be seen. Says the Gemara, when you go on the Harabais, you come to be seen by a Kaddish Baruch. You're like reporting for duty. Right? You're reporting, you want a Kaddish Baruch to see you, right? And where does Yeira'e come from? It comes from, from the last posset of the Akedas Yitzcha. Bahar Hashem Yeira'e. Right? And the Gemara in Chagiga says, that when you come on a for Shlosha Ragolim, you come lirot u That's the language of the Gemara. 
Lirois Ulahiroas. You come to see, what do you see? You see Kodni Babu Dasim, Levi Bashir Mabazimram, you have the full experience, the audio visual experience of the uh, of the of the of the of the base Hamikdash. That's what you see. That that's Lirois and Lahirois. Why Lirois and Lahirois? Because Avram Avinu said at the end of the Kedah, Har Hashem Yir'eh, Bahar Hashem Yeiro'eh. That connection that we have with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to see and be seen, that is centered around the Harabayas, centered around Yerushalayim, right? And the foundations were laid at the Akedah. But that's where it comes from. Avram and Yitzchak laid those foundations, right? And if you walk on the Harabayas, Anyone who walks on the Harabayas should think about the fact that you're walking on the stones that Avram and Yitzchak walked on. I don't know if anybody saw any of the video clips from Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever, ever seen so many people going up onto the Harabayas. I think they said there were over 2,000 people in one day who went up onto the Harabayas, and the authorities uh, relaxed the rules, because usually during the year, when Jewish people go up on the Harabayas, they're not allowed to daven, they're not allowed to sing, they're not allowed to wave flags, they're just allowed to walk through, because anything else is considered um, um, provocation, that's what it's called. In other words, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to daven in Trafalgar Square, and you're allowed to daven on Times Square, and you're allowed to daven anywhere in the world, but on Harabayas, you're not allowed to daven, right? Because that will aggravate the Arabs, but yet, but on Sunday, on Yom Yerushalayim, they relaxed all those rules, and they came in, and you can see video clips on YouTube, it's worth looking at, it's beautiful. People were saying hello, they ended up singing the Atikva and waving flags, and it was a, re- it was a moment where Klal Yisrael repossessed Harabayit in a way that I'd never seen before. I've never seen Harabayit being repossessed and re-acknowledged on such a level with such enthusiasm as was uh, this Sunday on, on Yom Yom Shalai. And it, I found it very heartwarming. Now, you and I all know that there are all sorts of halachic problems of going up onto Harabayas, and because there are halachic problems, most people don't go up. The truth is those halachic problems have solutions. Only one, generally speaking, for the general public, it, it's, it, it's not right to go up there because most people don't know how to behave up there and what preparations to make, etc. But if one knows how to prepare and go to the mikveh and wear Yom Kippur shoes and generally to behave as if you're in shul and Yom Kippur, uh, there, 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 there are ways to go onto the Harabayas and on a route which doesn't affect, which is not halachically problematic, but it's complicated and therefore it's better for most people not to go up. Uh, some of you might remember from London, there was, um, uh, Nachum Rabinovitz. Remember Nachum Rabinovitz? He was a massive Talmud Chacham in London, came from Toronto. He was in London. He was the head of Jews College for many years. And then he came uh, to uh, Israel and he became the Rosh Yeshiva of the Hezdi Yeshiva in Malay Adumim. You know, there's a big Hezdi Yeshiva in Malay Adumim established by Nachum Rabinovitz. Rosh Yeshiva passed away not, not long ago. Nachum Rabinovitz, among other, other things, was also uh, the, the Rebbe of Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, considered Nachum Rabinovitz as his rov, uh, his halachic authority, and he got smicha from Nachum Rabinovitz. I call Pony, why do I mention all this? Because in Malea Dumim, in the yeshiva, he instituted the, the, the idea that the boys were allowed to go up onto the Har Habayis after they had gone through a course. He gave a course of three shiurim of all the halachas, physically, uh, mentally, all the things you need to know before you go up onto the Har Abayis, right? If you can keep to all these instructions, then he let the boys go up on the Har Abayis, provided they graduated the course, the Mechina course of Aliyah, Aliyah onto the Har Abayis. So it is, a, it, it, it is a disputed issue, but in general, it's best for most people not to go up because most people will do more Averis than mitzvahs by going up, by getting it wrong. That's the problem. I'll call upon him that what's, in, what's important for our purposes is that Yerushalayim and the Harabayis uh, came into being at that spot and attaining that Kedusha, that eternal Kedusha, 
through the Akeda Tzitzchak. And that was the tefillah. I started off the shir by saying, Misha Onol Avrom Avinu Bahara Maria Hu Yanenu. What did Avrom Avinu daven for? So let's have a look at Rashi. Rashi already gives us a hint. Rashi says, right? So Rashi first says here, what does it mean that he sacrificed the ram Tachas to know? Says, says Rashi, Me Achashet Kosovo Yaleu Leola. Once the Posak has told us that Avram sacrificed the ram as a bird offering, that's it. We don't need to know any more than that. Why does it, why, the Posak could have ended there. He could have said that he had the ram. What does it mean, asks Rashi? What did it mean to say, we know already that the Malach has told him not to touch Yitzchak, not to Shalom sacrifice Yitzchak, right? So he's not doing that. We know that already. We know now that he's found the ram. All you need to know is that he made the ram as an oil. What did it mean, the possum, by saying tachas below? Says Rashi. So here comes already the, su the suggestion. I think it's the Masha, other Mufrashim. This was the tefillah that Avram Avinu davened Bahar HaMaria, which we mean when we say Misha Onal Avram Avinu. Look at this Rashi. Rashi says, I'm kol avodah sha'asom imed everything that he did to this ram, right, the Shechita, the Haprava, the Zerika Zadam, Hoyo Mispala, he davened, the Oymer, and he said, Yehi Ratsa, may be the will of HaKadosh Baruch, whoops, second, a will of HaKadosh Baruch, Hey Zu, Ki Ilu Asuye Bivni, that HaKadosh Baruch should see this, this Haprava of this ram as if I had done it with my son. In other words, the concept of a korban is to do something to the animal symbolically as if it's being done to us. Clearly, we don't want to chas uh, v'shalom kill uh, any other human being and no human being wants to sacrifice himself. But the idea of the sacrifice is in the korban. In other words, Avram Avinu makes a tefillah and says, Yihirotzon, that this uh, um, that this uh, carbon should be accepted as the uh, as the uh, sort of paradigm of all future carbonists. And what does it mean, Hashem Yir Es? Says Rashi, Pshuto Ketarguma. Okay, Hashem Yivcha. This is this, and this is Avram's tefillah. Hakadosh Baruch should choose the Yir Elo as Hamakom Azeh. That Hakadosh Baruch should see this Hamakom, this place. Lahashros boshchin also that the shchina should be present. Or lahakriv carbonus as a place for carbonus. So here you see in Rashi, you see in Rashi for the first time ever that the Har Maria has been identified, the Har Maria has been consecrated, and Avram at the end of the Akeda asks only for one thing: that this place for all future generations should be a place for. Avodat Hashem for the service of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, la hashvis um, So coming back, so there's something very interesting, which I think I might have mentioned before, but it's worth mentioning every year. Yom Yerushalayim, right? Coming back to what I mentioned earlier, where do we know? Where did David Amelach find? Who? How, how did David Amelach find out that this that this particular spot of Arabayas was that place? So we said it was Shmuel Hanavi. Right? Because don't forget, David was known as David HaMelech. He was a king, and he was the, maybe the greatest king ever. And Bez Hashem as Tzemach David Avdukham Eretz Atzmiach, a descendant of his will be the Mashiach. All that is fine. But David himself is never called a Novi. He's not referred to as a somebody with prophecy. He's not a Novi. So in order to know where the Mokam HaMikdash is, he needed Nevuah. So he plugs in to Shmuel Hanavi, and Shmuel Hanavi tells him this. Why is this interesting, that Shmuel Hanavi is the source of the Kedusha of Yerushalayim? Because, I, say, I think I mentioned this a few years ago, maybe, maybe not, because if you look in early sources, and it's even brought down in the Shulchan Aruch itself, there's a simon in the Shulchan Aruch, which speaks about unknown dates in the Jewish calendar, which have special significance for us. And one of those unknown dates is the 28th of Iyar. 
Kafchet Iya was a date which appears in the Shulchan Aruch and it even appears before him 150 years earlier in the Tur Shulchan Aruch, right? The, the Bar HaTurim in the Shulchan Aruch, which is about 600 years ago. He writes the 28th of Iyar has a great significance. Does anybody know what the significance is? 28th of Iyar. Anybody, anybody ever heard this before? I can't hear anybody saying anything. Dina, you look like you're saying something, but I can't hear you. Yom Ha'atzma'ot. Uh, well, no, not quite. 28th of Iyar is Yom Yerushalayim. That's what you mean to say. <coughs> 28th of Iyar is Yom Yerushalayim. 28th of Iyar, the day that Akarish Baruch who gave us this magnificent gift to be able to go to Yerushalayim. But that's not what the, that's not what the Shulchan Aruch says. Shulchan Aruch and the Torah says that the Kafchet Iyar is what? Is the yard site of Shmuel Hanavi. Oh, yeah. Yard site of Shmuel Hanavi. Recorded six, seven hundred years ago, they had a Masaira and brought down in the Poiskim that the 28th of Iyar is the yard site. It was always commemorated as the yard site of Shmuel Hanavi. And in my mind, I'm absolutely certain that it's okay. not by chance. This was a special gift to Shmuel Hanavi. I can who gave a gift to Shmuel Hanavi on that fateful day in June, 55 years ago. I think most of the people here in this Shia are of an age that they can remember uh, 55 years ago. Maybe not you, Dina, or you, Debbie, but something awesome. But I think most of the people here do, can remember. I certainly remember as a teenager. 55 years ago, on that day in June, when on the third day of the war, suddenly, in a completely unplanned and unprecedented, and nobody, nobody had given a thought to the idea, of capturing the old city of Jerusalem, suddenly there was a window opportunity. Suddenly there was an opportunity. And, uh, and it was a completely mina shamayim. If you look back at the story, I post some, a, a job for you, look back at the story of the Six Day War, and you will see that not militarily and not politically, they had no plans, there were no blueprints for an attack and to capture, recapture the old city of Jerusalem because it was unthinkable, right? They had also been begging Jordan not to get into the war. And it's only because Hussein, the king of Jordan, made the most insane decision of his life, right, to join in a war that was already lost. Right? He joined in a war that was already, it didn't, make, it didn't make any sense at all. If, if Hussein would not have joined in the war, we wouldn't have Yerushalayim or Yehuda or Shamran. Because Israel wasn't going to attack Jordan. And Israel said to him, we won't attack you if you don't get into this war. And then he decided against all logic and against his all self-interest to join the Six-Day War, to join the Egyptians, the Syrians and the Iraqis, that, he, that the Jordanians joined the war. As soon as he made that decision to join the war, the first thing that happened was the Israeli Air Force destroyed his entire Air Force on the ground. And then after that, they went into Yerushalayim which was under Jordanian rule, and they took it back in a defensive war. That had he not got into the war, there wouldn't have been an excuse for a defensive war against Jordan. It was only because they went in. Sadly, of course, they paid some heavy prices and the Gibata Tachmoshe, the Ammunition Hill, some people might know the story there, it's worth seeing, it's worth looking at. It was not an easy battle, but it was, this was the gift, I'm quite sure, a gift to Shmuel Hanovi on his yard, right? Some of you might be aware, in fact, of the, of the idea that there is a, um, does anyone know where the kever of Shmuel Hanavi is? So, so it's northwest of Jerusalem, it's called Nebi Samuel. Yes. Nebi Samuel is simply Arabe Aramaic for Navi, Shmuel Hanavi. Nebi is a Navi and Samuel is Shmuel. Nebi Samuel is Shmuel Hanavi. So there's a, a location called Shmuel, Nebi Samuel next to Ramot. In fact, I've been told mm -hmm. that, that the Shechuna called Ramot was called Ramot because in the, in the Tanakh, Shmuel is recorded as living in a place called Ramot, right? Mm -hmm. Shmuel Horomosa, that Shmuel came from a town called Ramot. 
So when, when they wanted to build a shkuna in the area of his kever, they called it Ramot, right? So the whole of Ramot is actually, so to speak, under the, uh, under the Egypt of Shmuel Hanavi, and that's where his kever is. And every year on 28th of Iyar, right, that was a place uh, where people used to go to, to commemorate his, his uh, 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 yard site even hundreds of years ago. So on his yard site, we got Yerushalayim back again, and I think that is something, um, there are no coincidences. In, in these matters, this is Ramos Machshavos Belev Ish, Ba'atzas Hashem Hisako. It's, uh, I think the Yom Yerushalayim has got a very, very profound and deep meaning for all of us, and it, and it connects us to Avram and Yitzchak. Now, interestingly, it also connects us to Yaakov. I haven't got it on the screen, uh, these psukim, but where, where is Harabayas connected to Yaakov? Anybody know? So this is the beginning of Vayetza, where Yaakov has a dream. The dream of the ladder with the Malachim going up and down, the beginning of Vayetza. Everybody knows that dream. Okay. What does he do when he gets up from that dream? He says, Ein zeh. He in base elokim v'ze sha'ar hashamay. Yaakov Avinu says, "I know what this place is. Right? This place will one day be a Beit elokim, a house of God, and it is already the sha'ar hashamay. It is the gates of heaven. Right? And this idea of sha'ar hashamay is a very profound idea, which connects us to the a very interesting halacha." Right? Everybody knows, every, every Jew in the world knows that when you daven, you face Yerushalayim. Doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Australia or South America or California, you take out a compass and you face Yerushalayim. Why do you face Yerushalayim when you daven? Because Yaakov Avinu said, This is the gateway for all our tfilas. All our tfilas come from all over the globe to Yerushalayim, and from there they connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Somehow HaKadosh Baruch Hu is connected to Yerushalayim in a way that he's not connected to anybody else. Um, the first person, incidentally, there's also another interesting topic which I won't go into detail about, but the first person, who was the first person who is recorded as davening towards Yerushalayim? So he's also the first person in the Tanakh who is recorded as davening Shachrit's Milch and Daniel. Who Daniel. Daniel. say? Daniel. Daniel. Who said that? Oh, Vivian. Thank you. Daniel, you're quite right. You've been learning Sefer Daniel. Sefer Daniel, right? So Daniel was kidnapped by Nebuchadnezzar into the Babylonian court. And in the Babylonian court, He's trying to survive spiritually. So he basically requests two things. He establishes two things. The first thing he requests is that he's allowed to eat a pure vegetarian diet, right? That he's living in the court of the king, surrounded by all the luxuries of trefus in the world. So he says, I'm going to eat only a vegetarian diet, to which the manager of the king's court says, wait a minute, if I give you a vegetarian diet, Within a short time, you'll look pale and undernourished and you won't have strength. He says, no, 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 don't worry. I'll eat a vegetarian diet and I'll look stronger than anybody else. And, and that's what happens. So Daniel is the first vegetarian um, for, for reasons, obviously, living in the, the tray for court. And the second thing it says about Daniel is that three times a day, he went to his room, opened the window facing Yerushalayim. That's what the apostle says. He opened the window facing Yerushalayim and he doubled to HaKadosh Baruch So here is Daniel. And what was in Yerushalayim at that time? The answer was nothing. The first base of Mikdash had been flattened, been completely destroyed. The Yerushalayim was in ruins, right? That's why Daniel was in exile, he was in Bovet. But he knew that Yerushalayim was Sha'ar Hashem. So here we have something very fascinating. We have Yerushalayim, all, all, all these different threads come together. If we want to celebrate Yom Yerushalayim properly, we have to know one thread that connects us to Avram Yitzhak at the Akeda, Hashem Yireh, another thread that connects us to Yaakov, that it's Shara Shamayim, 
and another thread that connects us to Shmuel and Novi and David Amelech, right? And that actually is emphasized by the date of the 28th of Iyar, Yom Yerushalayim, and the gift uh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. And this is a, a, a very, these are just some of the very beautiful, profound, uh, 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 deeper understandings of why Yom Yerushalayim is so, uh, uh, is so important to us. And there's no question that Yom Yerushalayim, when we celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, we're actually not just celebrating the fact that we, that we got back the Kaisal and the Harabayas, but the whole victory of the, uh, the Six-Day War. Does anybody here remember what, 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 what the feeling of the Jewish community worldwide was in the three or four weeks before, before the Six-Day War? Does anybody remember? Yes, maybe you want to say something. You have to unmute yourself. I'll try and unmute you. Okay, so in other words, before the Six Day War, the the whole of the Jewish world was in complete and utter shock and, and trepidation that there would be another Holocaust in the land of Israel. And if you if you you, you can see even today on, on video on YouTube, you can see the speeches given by NASA. NASA made public speeches to hundreds of thousands of uh, of uh, uh, screaming uh, and hysterical Arabs that we're going to slaughter every Jew in the land of Israel. We're going to clean out these wretched Zionists. Tabach el Yahud. We're going to slaughter all the Jews, and we're going to completely uh, overrun. It's going to be all-out war, and we're going to restore the pride of the Arab nations. And don't forget, Medinat Israel at that time was less than twenty years old was still very small and militarily and economically a very small nation. And the Egyptians had been armed to the teeth by the Soviet Union. The Soviets had rearmed them with, with new tanks and new surface to air missiles. And they felt incredibly confident for the Syrians also had been rearmed by the Soviet Union. And the Iraqis came into the world war. And, every, and in Israel, there was an unbelievable, you speak to people who lived in Israel, in April, May, uh, before the June of 1967, and they were, they were digging graves. They, they transformed some of the public parks in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem into graveyards, and they were digging graves. They were digging thousands of graves. In fact, in Neri Israel, we had one, one gentleman, um, uh, Arthur Matias, some of you might remember Mr. Matias from Neri Israel. So he was, uh, in, in the army uh, 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 in 1967, and he remembers digging, digging graves, in, digging potential graves in Tel Aviv, thousands of them, in the weeks before the war, because they were sure there would be an invasion, there'd be bombing, there would be unbelievable slaughter, and how are we going to survive that? And uh, everybody was completely shaking in their boots of, of what was going to happen. And it was only just a little bit more than 20 years after the Holocaust. And here there was going to be another Holocaust. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided, Kilo Yitzhak Shashem Amoi Benachalosoi Lo Yaz. HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that he was not going to abandon Klal Yisrael. And against all the numbers and the arms and the soldiers and all the, all the logic and all the military know-how, um, Klal Yisrael, uh, were, were victorious in, in, in the fastest war in history. The Six Day War is called the Six Day War because no one's ever heard of a Six Day War. In the history of warfare, there's never been a Six Day War, a war that was finished conclusively within six days. It's never happened before, ever, right? And this is this was a nice, a complete and utter nice. I'm convinced that in a hundred years' time, right, Jewish people will look back at the Six Day War and they will celebrate it like today we celebrate Hanukkah. We celebrate Hanukkah today because of the tremendous victories of the Hashmanoi, restoring Jewish sovereignty to the land of Israel, 
and that was the great success of the Hashmanoim, Matisyob and Yochran Kain Godol, the Hashmanoim, the Yuda Maccabee. The achievements of Hanukkah are exactly the achievements of the Six Day War 55 years ago. And honestly, I think people who don't commemorate the Yom Yerushalayim are simply blind. They can't see the hand of our Baruch. But even that's mentioned in Chazal, incidentally. There's a Gemara in Nida which says, Ein Baal Hanais Makir Bemisa. Somebody who is in the middle of a miraculous time doesn't recognize the miracle because he's in the middle of it. You need a bit of distance in order to see just how miraculous uh, something is. And because we're in the middle of it, and because there are, sadly, there are some voices, some rabbinic voices who say, no, one shouldn't celebrate these things. It's all, uh, it's all puzzle, right? And they're all blind. They're just completely and utterly blind to the way in which the nace of HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved Kanal Yisrael, the way in which that nace has permanently transformed our lives for the good, and that our children and grandchildren are taking it for granted. You get on a plane, you go to visit Yerushalayim, you go to Yeshiva in Yerushalayim, you go to seminary in Yerushalayim. There's more Torah today in Yerushalayim possibly than there's ever been in the history of Klaus. And, and there's so much to be thankful for and happy about that Yom Yerushalayim is possibly one of the most magnificent days of the year, Kaf Chet Iyar, and we are thankful to the and it connects us to the others. So I'll just finish out with a beautiful posuk in Tehillim uh, about Yerushalayim, which I want to just learn with you for a few minutes. And this is Tehillim Kuf Kaf Beis, one of the Shir Hamalas, right? So it's only got nine psukim. All the Shir Hamalas are very brief. So let's just read together a few psukim, and with that we'll finish for today. Posuk says, Shir Hamalas Ladov. I rejoiced when people said to me that we are going to the Beit Hashem, the house of God. Now here's something interesting. David HaMelech never saw the Beit Hashem. The base of Mikdash was only built after he died by his son Shlom, as I mentioned earlier. So what, what this possible must mean is Beit Hashem Nelech, that we are on the way. We are on the road to building the Beit. I, I rejoiced when people said, you know what, we haven't got yet the Beis Hashem, but Beis Hashem Nelech, we are Baderech, we are going towards uh, the Beis Hashem. Says so David, the next Pasuk, famous Pasuk, Om dos hoyu ragleinu, bish orayich Yerushalayim. Our feet stood firm at the gateways to Yerushalayim. So this is already David describing the here and now for him. He came to Yerushalayim, fought the battle, and conquered uh, Yerushalayim from the Yebusim, and his feet were standing firmly, meaning he was omade here. It doesn't just mean to stand, but it means to withstand, right? La'amod ba'milchama. La'amod ba'milchama means to, to, to survive a war, to be successful in battle. So omdos ho yuragleg, our feet were standing firmly, in the gates of Yerushalayim, and here he goes on to say one of the most famous psukim about Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim habanuya ke'ir shechubro lo yachtov. I want you to look at this at this passage just for a minute, because this passage, I think, is a magic passage. That Yerushalayim habanuya means once Yerushalayim is fully built, meaning, as I say, David Amara had the vision, he had the blueprint, he had the nevuah from Shmuel, he had the promise of Hamakoma Sheyibcha Hashem Alekecha. So he knew the Yerushalayim would be built. What is it? I look at this definition here. Ke'ir, it is like a city. Shechubra la yachto. Which is, so what does chubra mean? Chubra comes from the word chibur. Right? Mm-hmm. What's the tra- good translation of chubra? Yeah. United. Say? say it again. United. Connect. Yes, to connect. connect. It means to connect. Connect, connect together. Chibur. Lit chaber means to connect to something, right? From the word chaver, right? A chibur is a connection. And, and chuburah means to unite together, yachdav, together. So what is, so this posseg is actually, I think, a mag, why do I say it's a magic posseg? Because Yerushalayim has the power. So if you look at all the mafarshim and the midrashim, about this pasuk, it says, 
Pasuk is expressing a truth on lots of different levels. So let me ask you, in what sense is it the city that is Chubra la Yachta? Has anybody got any, any suggestions? In what sense Yerushalayim is, a, is, is the connecting city? All the nations will bring sacrifices. Say it again. My husband says all the nations will bring sacrifices. Okay, very good. Yes, so, so I, I think that's, that's the last chapter. You're quite right. The last chapter is our vision of Yibosa Moshiach Kibesi based to Fila Yikorela Cholho Ami, that all of mankind will come together to Yerushalayim to serve Akarish Baruch Hu, right? And if you look in Yeshaya chapter two, for example, it says, Bovo Amin Rabim, lots of nations will come and they will go to the base Hashem. Why? So, you sh- so what does Yeshaya say in chapter two? Kimitsia and Taitse Taira, Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim. That's Yeshaya telling us about the most, most of Moshiach that Yerushalayim will become a spiritual center for mankind, not just for the Jewish people. So you're quite right. It unites the whole of mankind. What else does it unite? We in Hashem, the yes. You're quite right. It's Mechaber between man and God. That's the Sha'ar HaShamayim principle. In some way, at in Yerushalayim, we are able, our tefillahs, somehow uh, are, are more effective. It's, it's, it's a local call rather than an international call. You know, if you're davening in Yerushalayim, so mm-hmm. your tefillahs are a local call. Your Akadosh Baruch Hu is listening. We are connected to Akadosh Baruch Hu, connect us. Okay, any other offers? So the other meanings also are what I mentioned just before. It connects us to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. When we go to Yerushalayim and we are on the Har Habayis and we think about the Kedusha of Har Habayis, this connects us to Avra Mitzvah connects us to the Ovois and Sefer Barashis in the most tangible and powerful way. Avra Mitzvah with the Akeda, Yaakov with the Shara Shabayim, all that is part of the Chubra La Yacht. But Dovah Melech has another meaning for it, and we, just I'll finally mention here, what, what is it about your Yerushalayim that connects us all? Shesham olu shavotim. Look at passage number four. Shesham, because there, olu shavotim, shiftei ka, because all the tribes get together. Right? When the Jewish people lived in Israel, so some lived in the Galil, some in the Negev, some in Yehuda, some on the coast, but three times a year, they would all come olu, the word olu here, the second word in this passage, is from the word Aliyah Larega. Shasham Olu Shabotim Shifteka. All the tribes come on come on, on, on Shlosha Ragalim to Yerushalayim. Eidus Li Yisrael. And that is a testimony that Klal Yisrael give right, of their connection to Akarish Baruch Hu. Lahodos Lashem Hashem. To give thanks to Akarish Baruch Hu, as the Possek says for Shlosha Ragalim, Ish Kamatnas Yodoi. That the Shlosh and Golem are there for us to give thanks to Akadosh Baruch Hu. But in the meantime, Yerushalayim unites Klal Yisrael and all the different tribes who are maybe at odds with each other on various other levels comes Pesach Shavuos and Sukkot. They all come together. And then he goes on to say, and there's another uniqueness about Yerushalayim that I mentioned earlier: the Sanhedrin. Kishama Yoshvu Kisos the Mishpat. There in Yerushalayim, there's also the Kisaot, meaning the chairs, the places, the seat of justice, meaning the Sanhedrin, Kisos the base David, and also the seat of royalty. Right? In other words, in Yerushalayim was also the palace of the king, was also the seat of the Sanhedrin, was also the place of the Mizbeach, the Karbonus, the Kodim Nevi'im. All that was connected. In Yerushalayim. And then he ends up with, with, a, with a tefillah. The last four psukim are a tefillah. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. We should daven for the peace of Yerushalayim. Yishalom b'chelech. Sha'alu b'amun esayich. That there should be peace and harmony and unity in all the buildings of Yerushalayim. Laman achai v'reya. Oops. Laman achai v'reya. Adabra n'ashalam b'ach. Famous psukim. This is a special nine. Uh, 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 it's a, it's a Shira Amala's worth learning off by heart. It's 
So whenever you go to the coastal and you go to Yerushalayim, you should say this Mizma. Samachti ba'omimli beis Hashem neilech. Own those how you raglein of Bishariah Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim ha'ben New York. Ki'ir she'chub v'lo yachtam. It's something worth knowing off by heart. It's it's one of the gems of Tehillim, right? Which which describes for us so many wonderful aspects of Yerushalayim. And we are so privileged. When I say we, I mean everybody here on the in the Shia and all our families. We are so privileged to live in a generation in which our grandparents and great grandparents didn't they didn't even dream about it. They didn't even dream about it. They just knew they just knew that it would be some future, in some distant future plan, we'd come back to Yerushalayim, but they didn't even really have real dreams because it was just so impossible. And yet Akarish Baruch has made it possible in, in our lifetime. And for that, we need to be eternally grateful and to appreciate the beauty of Yerushalayim and the, the, in, the impact that Yerushalayim has had. Right? And interestingly, that the, the Six Day War conquest of Yerushalayim also opened the hearts of tens of thousands. The whole, the whole Bamchuva movement really only started was only triggered off by the Six Day War. All the organizations, Asia Toros, Samea, all these places, they only opened, they only started after the Six Day War. Because the Six Day War somehow, even if you were a teenager uh, living on the beach in California, if you knew you were Jewish, suddenly being Jewish meant something amazing. Until then, being Jewish just meant gefilte fish and bagels. Didn't mean anything. Or as, or as uh, Sharadsky writes, before the Six Day War, being Jewish simply meant that people hated me. That it had no other meaning for me other than that I was hated uh, by the by the non Jews. That's the only meaning I had in my mind what it meant to be Jewish. Because I was Jewish, I was discriminated against and I was hated. But after the Six Day War, suddenly we had a victory of biblical proportion. And suddenly we were back in Yerushalayim. And suddenly we were back in Yehuda and Shamran, and we were back in Hebron. It wasn't just Yerushalayim, it was Hebron, right? It was Yericho, it was Shechem. We were back in biblical Israel. Gush Etzion, right? We were back in biblical Israel. And that is the, the, the magnificent nace of, of Yerushalayim, which began in Sefer Barashas. And that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to see you. And uh, I, hope, I hope everybody enjoyed this Shia. It's you know, speaking from the heart, really, about my feelings about Yerushalayim and the beauty of it and the significance of it. And it's something which we should all treasure and hand on to our children and grandchildren. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Great. you, Rabbi. Thank you very much.